Born in 1950 with a very common name in the world of notable people, David Joseph Smith is a legend in the world of music synthesis. At the age of 24, he founded Sequential Circuits, a company named after an analog sequencer that he designed to go with the Mini Moog that he bought two years prior. Going full-time in 1977, he went on to co-design the Prophet 5, a five-voice dual VCO analog synthesizer with the ability to program a patch and recall it with the push of a button. This is considered by many the first synthesizer with presets, and it was only possible with the breakthrough of microprocessors. This led the Prophet 5 to become a smash success, being used by everybody from Dr. Dre and Jean-Michel Jarre to New Order and Kraftwerk. I'm not going to bring up Kraftwerk every single time I go into the history of like some synthesizer thing. It's just really, really hard not to bring up Kraftwerk when you're talking about the history of synthesis. I'm just... They were kind of there for like a lot of the history of synthesis. It's... They were just... Their, his engineering eyes always set towards the future. He went on to work with Roland founder and fellow engineering legend Ikutaro Kakehashi on a universal system that would allow electronic music instruments to communicate regardless of make, brand, or purpose. This work would yield Musical Instrument Digital Interface, or MIDI, a system so open-ended and powerful that we still use it 43 years later. After an amazing run in the 1980s with such synthesizers as the 6-Track, the Pro 1, and the Prophet 600, Sequential Circuits was acquired by Yamaha and shut down in 1987 due to the shifting demand in the synthesizer world from the dated analog sound to the new future of synthesis, frequency modulation, and digital synthesizers. A decade spent working for various companies, Dave Smith eventually started a new synth company in 2002 under the wholesome name Dave Smith Instruments. Lately ahead of the analog renaissance of the 2000s and the 2010s, DSI would create many gems that would contribute heavily to said renaissance. Gems like the Evolver, the Temptist, the Mofo. It's called the Mofo. We're going to be saying Mofo a lot in this video. I'm really sorry. I don't know why. And the Prophet 08. These synthesizers proved that not only was there still a demand for analog synthesis, but that Dave Smith was still, in fact, a wizard. If I was simply recounting the legacy of Mr. Dave Smith, I would keep going. I would continue the story and talk about, in 2015, DSI's eventual rebrand back to Sequential. I would talk about his eventual heart attack and death in 2022. I would talk about more synths that he would go on to create. But we're not going to talk about anything like that today. We're going to talk about the DSI era, and we're going to talk about the greatest synthesizer to come out of the 2000s, and maybe my favorite synthesizer of all time. The Dave Smith Instruments Tetra the most underrated synthesizer to ever come out. Let's do a basic rundown of the synth real quick. The Dave Smith Instruments Tetra is a very unique synth, even in the world of unique synthesizers and weirdo desktop synths. It's very compact. It's very small. Compact is just a nice way to say small when you think about it. I've owned a lot of desktop synths. I've had the Mother 32 by Moog. I've had the Dreadbox Erebus. I've had Waldorf's Pulse 2. And I've had the Blofeld. And none of those synths are anywhere near as small as the Tetra. Just very, very small machine. It's also worth noting that while most of the synths that I have mentioned are either digital or monophonic, with the exception of the Pulse 2's weird paraphonic square wave thing, the Tetra is a four-voice polyphonic synthesizer. Four analog voices. Each voice also has two oscillators per voice. Very little space is actually wasted on the device itself. We have two potentiometers for your filter, two notched encoders for attack and decay, and four assignable encoders in the center for any parameter. Up top here we've got an output jack for headphones, and not one, not two, but four quarter inch audio output jacks which is wild for any synthesizer. We also have MIDI in-out, which is pretty standard, and what could be mistaken for a 3-port, but is instead a 5-pin DIN port for connecting a Tetra to another DSi instrument that also has this poly chain out feature. This was notably included with the MoFo and with the Prophet 08 as well. The idea being that you could actually daisy chain all these synths together, have them run on one patch, and you have like this massive, massive patch running a bajillion voices if you just chained all of these synths together. This is actually possible because all three of these synths, the MoFo, the Tetra, and the Prophet 08 are actually running on the same engine. Technically, the MoFo is a one-voiced Prophet 08, and the Tetra is a four-voiced MoFo. Internally on this thing, we're working with DSI's signature DCOs, providing a sawtooth wave, a triangle wave, a saw-triangle hybrid, and a square waveform with the pulse width modulation of the square being really controllable. Really, really tunable. You can sync the individually tunable oscillators and throw in tuning drift to mimic more analog-y behavior. 
We'll get to that. We also have some really beefy sub oscillators that sound really nice. Every patch can be split AB style in two and you can decide the note that separates the two mini patches. The Curtis low pass filters are changeable in between two and four pole. The latter's extremely resonant as Curtis filters tend to be. It also has its own DADSR envelope. That's handy, that's nice. I appreciate that. These foundations are kind of standard for a good synthesizer, I mean, a good filter and a good oscillator really makes or breaks the synth. Ask Moog, they've made literally a career out of insane oscillators and really, really, really nice filters. But every synth that I mentioned earlier, all those S-top synths, also had really, really nice oscillators and really, really nice filters. So what is it about this that separates them from the rest? Why am I making a whole video about this guy? Every good synthesizer has at least one LFO. An LFO is a low frequency oscillator, and it's used to modulate one aspect of your patch on a synthesizer. Usually it's predispositioned to either modulate like the pitch of an oscillator, for example, or the cutoff frequency value of your filter. And most analog synths maybe have two, usually just one, because an oscillator is still an oscillator, and analog oscillators are expensive. They're very difficult to put into a synth without just breaking the bank if you're doing more than one. The Tetra, oh, it's upside down. <laughs> the Tetra has four oscillators per patch, four. Like I said earlier, usually LFOs are stuck modulating like, you know, your cutoff frequency or your pitch values for an oscillator or something. With the Tetris LFOs, you can modulate nearly anything, including aspects of the other LFOs. They can be really, really insanely, beautifully time-takingly slow. They can be pitch-creatingly fast, which is fascinating. The range that you can modulate is really intense. It's extremely, extremely big, and it's extremely tunable, which is really nice. They're so versatile, I've actually used them before to tune the actual oscillators into specific intervals, and I've done that to make like massive chords in a way that really isn't intended, but like is so accurate that you can actually make like a really big seventh chord, for example. It's a nice way to actually just stretch the number of like pitches and stuff that you're getting out of one voice, which it's kind of like old chiptune music does a very similar thing with like really fast arpeggios, but you can do that with this. And that is, that alone is nuts. That's crazy. And the LFO modulations on this are really, really nice, obviously. It would have been super nice if there were like other really crazy ways to modulate aspects of the patch, but you know, just the LFOs alone, I think that's a selling point. I lied, there are so many ways you can modulate everything. There is an entire DADSR envelope that has one job, and that is to modulate anything you assign it to modulate. That's awesome. That's great. That's more synthesizers should have that, because that's that's handy. Do you want your LFO to like speed up and slow down according to the values of like something really organic like an envelope, maybe? Do you want your pulse width on your square wave to do a very similar thing? Envelopes are a very easy way to add like organic breath into a synth patch and just Dave Smith knew that, and they just threw one in, and that's great. That's, it's just really, really handy. It's really nice. Not only that, you have four extra points of modulation that you can have anything, essentially modulate anything else. This is extremely handy, for example, if you want one of your LFOs to like modulate not only the thing you've already assigned it to, but maybe something else. Maybe you're having it do not only specific pitches, you're also having it do, for example, pulse width. I know I keep talking about pulse width. It's a great thing to modulate. Sue me, I'm a video game artist. Modulation is a playground, and this thing is pizza day at recess. This. This made a lot more sense in my head when I was writing the script. We haven't even gotten into like the assignable area where you have so much modulation control using very, very common MIDI aspects of you got your mod wheel, you have aftertouch, you have breath control, you have initial velocity, you have foot control. And perhaps the greatest way to modulate aspects of your patch go right back to the origins of the name of this company. A sequential baby. Included on each patch is a master clock and not one, not two, but four sequencers. All four sequencers are set to a master beat subdivision of the master clock, making it as slow or as fast as you need. These can modulate pretty much anything you need them to, including not only pitch, but quarter steps in between the pitches. You can do like really crazy 303-esque stuff with that and like glide values. Each sequencer can be an assignable number of steps between one and 16. And you can have them assigned at multiple different things. So like, you don't have to have just a bunch of 16 step sequences. You could, for example, and I do this a lot, you could have two of the sequences 
sequences modulating the pitch, but one is actually like, you know, four or five steps and the other is a full 16. So you can have your line running that you've programmed out, and then another one is occasionally maybe adding like a fifth or, you know, like an, even just like an octave up to make your sequence act that much more interesting. And that's just two of the sequences doing that specific thing. You have so many options with this. You can just do an insane amount to your patch. The sequences themselves are wildly flexible. It doesn't just have to be press the button, there you go, run sequence. You could have it start from the beginning every single time. You could just completely ignore the gate. You can do this insane function where every time you hit a note, it's the next step in the sequence. It's kind of like when you program out on like a Casio SK-1, for example, the one key play. A lot of Casios do this. It's very, very similar. It's wild that they thought of that. That is so handy. That is made songs for me. Just the ability to like hit a thing and play it. I use it in covers all the time. I used it in the Katamari one very recently. The sequencer alone just makes it such an insanely powerful synthesizer and it's like you can do so much with that. This level of control that you have over a patch, like, you get this in like DAWs, you get this in like thousands of dollars worth of like analog modulars, modules and stuff. You get this level of control when you buy like a really big fancy groove box to control all your stuff. It's all built in! It is all built into this thing! Just per patch, it's insane. I have never seen another standalone synthesizer with this much control for this price point. And keep in mind, analog, it's analog. It sounds that crazy with analog. But let's pull back a bit. Let's take some excitement out of the room. I had a lot of coffee before I filmed this essay. Is it obvious? It's like four o'clock. I'm gonna have such a hard time falling asleep tonight. I did this to myself. That's fine, that's not the issue. I mentioned earlier that this has more or less the same engine in it as the Prophet 08 and the MoFo, and yet I'm not cheerleading for either one of those. I mean, they both have like the insane sequencers and stuff. So why the Tetra? Why not four more voices in like the Prophet 08, which is an eight voice synthesizer? What is it about this versus something like the Prophet 08? This? is a four voice analog synthesizer with the ability to split every single voice into its own monophonic patch. Each patch still has its own independence. That means its own set of sequencers, its own set of LFOs, its own set of its own clocks and stuff. It makes four individual patches all running independently. Oh, it gets even better than that. Remember the thing I said earlier about the, the multiple outputs on this thing? The reason is, you can have each voice assigned out to its own individual output. Or, you can have voices 3 and 4 on their own outputs, 1 and 2 are sharing outputs 1 and 2, and that way you can do some crazy stereo panning stuff. It's actually how Factual Brains, when we used to use like a big synth rig, we had two patches going out into like either like a delay or a reverb pedal, we had one just going straight out into the board with the bass boosted for some nice low end. We had one going into a, a Cori KP3 Plus, like the Crazy Chaos Pad, for some really insane stuff. This thing is essentially four analog synths in one. It gets better. There's an option called multi-mode. Multi-mode separates the four voices into their own MIDI controlled voice. So you have voice one on MIDI channel one, MIDI channel two has voice two, and so on and so forth. This, this converts your Tetra into four analog synths that can do whatever they want as long as you can have multiple ways to control multiple channels. This is what turns your Tetra into four different mofos. Remember that thing I said earlier? Technically, the mofo is a one voice Prophet 08 and the Tetra is a four voiced mofo. We call that foreshadowing. Yeah, I wasn't kidding. I cannot put into words how handy this is. Between the sequences, between the MIDI control, between everything, the way that, that your synthesizer just becomes four independent synths in one box off one power supply with four outputs, it's nuts. This is why this is like the most underrated synthesizer to me. It's nuts what you can do with it. My band Factual Brains, we used to use a live synth rig before we switched entirely to a computer for completely unrelated reasons. We used to have like a couple different synthesizers and over time we just ended up just using this guy because it did everything we needed to. It made such big full live sounds. Just this! When you're when you're traveling as a touring band, space is really, really valuable. We did everything out of a pedal board case, and this was the one synthesizer we needed because it was four synthesizers. It was four full sounding analog synthesizers in one box. That is nuts. That is insane that Dave Smith figured out how to, how to do this. It's 
mind-boggling. I've been making wacky synth music for over 10 years, and I've owned so many synthesizers, and I've sold virtually everything that has MIDI and out that isn't this thing, because this thing just does everything I've wanted it to. And it's still four voices and analog, and it's insane in that regard. And I love synthesizers that are just big analog machines covered in knobs that you have to like sculpt every patch like right before you use it like don't get me wrong I love that all day that is the way to play with synthesizers my micromog is like one of my prized possessions for that reason but when you're playing live you need to just hit a button and go to your next patch it's extremely important not to have downtime when you're live and you know the, granted this is my experience I will say but the way that this thing just press a button four patches that's nuts the speed the accuracy that it does it in this is a performer synth. This is one of the greatest sounding synths I've ever had. It's just such a powerful synth for live use. Like speaking of live use, this thing is built like a tank. This thing has got metal enclosures. It's got these knobs that feel, first off, they feel great, but they also just, they can, you can see the abuse that it sustains. Just like with the with my DTX Multi 12, I've toured this thing across the country and it's, it's strong, it's powerful. It's I've never worried about it on stage. It's just so strong. It's such a good synth for that reason. I haven't even mentioned the price yet. I keep talking about like the price point of like, you know, like, oh, you know, this is $2,000. In 2009, when these things came out, they were $800. They were under $1,000 and they had more features than most like $2,000 synths do these days. Right now on Reverb, you can get one for about $600. A four voice analog synthesizer, not even factoring in like the combo and the multi mode for $800. That's insane. That's nuts. That's wild that they just, yeah, here you go. And it, huh, I could keep going forever about this thing. I love this synth. Such an underrated synthesizer. I hope that this video inspires people to go buy one of these on Reverb. It is an insanely good synthesizer. So, why didn't it catch on? I'm gonna preface this next part of the video by saying that this is a lot of speculation and it's my opinion and it's based on growing up as a teenager in the mid to late 2000s in a Midwestern Rust Belt city and these are my experiences. In the late 2000s and the early 2010s, the synthesizer scene was very different than we know now. You could, and I had friends who did this, you could buy an old analog synth for like nothing in the mid 2000s. Like I have a friend who bought a Roland JX3P at a garage sale for $50. They go for this much on reverb right now. If you were just like looking for a weird sound for your band that was like clearly inspired by like LCD Sound System or Animal Collective or Radiohead or Beck or The Shins or whatever, you just, you wanted a wacky keyboard sound, you could get something for like 200 bucks and you didn't have to dig that hard. You could go to a pawn shop, you could go to a music store, you could go to a garage sale in some instances. You could just find these things. Analog synthesizers at that time were cheap because digital took over. Digital was this insane force on the synthesizer world because it was cheaper to produce. It was more consistent. Analog synths had drift on them. They had like problems staying in tune. They were vintage dinosaurs. They were ancient. They were like a lot of them were like, you know, 15 years old in some cases. And if you wanted like a brand new synthesizer, quote unquote, like it was like getting a Elisa's Micron or it was getting like a, a Microcorg or even like the Roland Gaia was pretty popular at the time. These were all digital synths. These were all reliable digital synths. My local guitar center had like an actual keyboard section and the synthesizer section was a Dave Smith Instruments Mofo, it was a Microcorg and an Elisa's SR16. There were also like a couple chaos pads, but it was like mostly workstation pianos, honestly. So when you look at the reason that analog even came back in the 2000s, they were cheap. It's the reason flannel became a fashion statement in the 90s, because grunge kids could afford flannel and not much else. Brian Eno once famously said, Whatever you find weird, ugly, uncomfortable, and nasty about a new medium will surely become its signature. This is to say that the things that people really liked about analog were the things that people hated about them in the 80s when digital came out. They were bulky, they were big, they were like built like tanks, but they were hard to control. And the analog drift was a huge problem. Oscillators need a lot of time to warm up. The analog drift, for example, I keep mentioning it, it was considered like this lush chorus effect in the 2000s. The Tetra has a built-in version of that because people liked it so much. If you wanted to play synth in any band, you had cheap options. And 
$800 was a lot to spend. Like if you were a synth player, you were already kind of a specialist in your band that was trying to sound like of Montreal, for example. There's another thing we do kind of have to talk about in the world of synthesis, and it's sort of the elephant in the room, which a few of you have probably already predicted what I'm about to say when it comes to synthesizers. This is a desktop synth. When it comes to desktop synthesizers, you need a way to control them. You need like a MIDI controller. You need either like a sequencer or you need like a like a groove box or like an MPC or some sort of thing to control this. You know, a microcorg might sound like a Casio or something by comparison to this, but it's an all-in-one unit. You can control it with no problem. So of course people bought microcorgs. They were all-in-one packages. It's the reason workstation pianos are popular. It's the reason that desktop synthesizers in general are kind of a specialist thing. My local guitar center, the MoFo I talked about earlier, I'm pretty sure it didn't even have a keyboard set up to it. I don't think anyone ever actually bought it. I'm sure some employee just took it one day because they didn't know you needed a keyboard to control it. So people were just like, what is this? Even now it's desktop synthesizers are still kind of a specialist thing because you're probably using them like with your big setup. Like it's like, like I used it. I used an MPC to control this. I used my sample pad to control it. I know that kind of thing, but also I'm a synth enthusiast. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people watching this video didn't know the term desktop synthesizer before this video. Okay, but there were still like synth nerds in the 2000s. Like shouldn't it? they have like fallen in love with this thing the way that I, a synth nerd, have fallen in love with this thing. Analog was a different thing in the 2000s. It was either this very much sought after, like, oh man, you can get all this stuff for so cheap now, or it was this curse word. And in the 2000s, digital still had legs. There was still a lot of amazing synthesizers coming out. You had the Waldorf Blofeld, you had the Access Virus TI, you had the explosion of DAW VSTs that, like, you could just make any sound you wanted. If you were okay with digital, and you should be, digital's great. Digital makes some insanely powerful sounds. You had options, and you had options for cheap. The mid and late 2000s and early 2010s in the digital realm was its own heyday. Just, you had beautiful sounding things. The Blofeld, I've mentioned it a few times. It's an amazing synthesizer. It is worth checking out. Point is, is that something like this for $800, it's still kind of a huge ask. Like. Especially when, you know, if you're an analog synth nerd, you could buy stuff for cheaper that could do more if you were willing to deal with vintage. If you were a digital nerd, you're good. You, this, this thing isn't digital. Or is it? There's another elephant in the room I really need to address, and it's the oscillators in this thing. They are DCOs. DCOs are digitally controlled oscillators versus what is typical in analog, which is VCO, which is voltage controlled oscillators. Two really oversimplify like a giant long debate that isn't really worth getting into nor am I really qualified to tell you. Digitally controlled oscillators are not fully analog because you're still technically using microprocessors to control them versus like actual full-on analog hardware. It's not a hundred percent analog. The oscillators themselves are still analog oscillators. You're still getting the warmth of electricity, but maybe it's not as warm. This is all very subjective. It's all very per taste. There are people who do not use DCOs because they think they're disgusting. They think that they're a cheap digital-esque version of analog. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying DCOs sound good, okay? That's where I stand on it. But analog purists turn their noses at DCO and that's fine. They're allowed to. They, you can do whatever you want. Music is beautiful because you can do whatever you want. For some people, VCOs are just the solution. So analog purists did not want this. They didn't want most Dave Smith stuff. This thing also does have its host of issues. That's not perfect. I wouldn't fault anybody if any one of these were deal breakers because it's not perfect. Nothing is. Big one is that, yes, it has technically five outputs, technically six if you want to count the headphones as two. There are no inputs on it. It would have been amazing if you could sequence like some stuff with the filters and then input like you know something to really get that warmth of the curtis filters and just really push that sound over the top it's not possible it's understandably they probably did that to save money completely get it totally fine it's still kind of a disappointment honestly just you could have done some crazy stuff with like filter processing that way programming on this thing there's two big ways to do it there's menu diving for days and then there's doing it on your computer to start with the computer i've never found a way on the computer to program a patch that i enjoy there's a couple third party methods there's actually a first party dave smith way to do it i don't like it i like programming on the thing itself 
And speaking of, to do so, you have to menu dive. When you menu dive on something like this, you have to go through every single variable and every single aspect of your patch, and you have to modulate it piece by piece. You essentially have to have the synthesizer memorized. You have to know exactly what you're doing in here before you can do it on here, which gives this thing like an insane learning curve. And it was like a year before I could actually really like get any of the full potential out of this thing when I was learning it. It's a very complicated synthesizer for still being just a subtractive analog synth. And also, I totally don't fault anybody if they don't like menu diving. Some people see menu diving as like this weird, horrible curse, and that's that's fine. Menu diving is not ideal, I get it. I personally don't mind it. And even as amazing as like the combo mode is, especially like when you're running multi-mode, it's a little buggy. I have several times ran into an issue where I'm trying to fix one little part of one of the patches in combo mode. I just fix one little thing, I hit right on it, I confirm it, and then I've corrupted everything. And I've lost all of the patches I was working on. I should have just played acoustic guitar sounds pretty good right now. I hate it. So this glitch doesn't happen every single time, and it's something I forgot about for the first couple of years writing patches on this thing and when it happened and I just lost all of my work, which took a while to do. It makes you want to quit music sometimes. It's rough. And it's something they never fixed. It was a, a glitch that's just never been resolved. Even in community made updates to the, to the firmware on this thing, they've just never fixed it. But you know, everything has quirks and a lot of this is me just kind of venting about some frustrations I have with what is otherwise an amazing synth. I could sit here for hours and I could talk about how great this thing is. I haven't even mentioned the feedback gain feature, which makes like insane sounds. I've barely mentioned how the oscillators themselves just sound really nice and that the square waves are like perfect chiptune square waves, in my opinion. I haven't talked about how you can use the LFO to do like this trick with the sequencer where you can kind of make 32 step pitch sequences in some crazy ways. I haven't even talked about like the arpeggiator function in this thing and that alone is pretty awesome. I've left a lot of features out of this video because I didn't want to make it just six hours long and I didn't want to make it this insane ramble more than it needed to be. I haven't even talked about how this thing sounds lush, it sounds gnarly, it sounds beautiful, it sounds pretty. You can do so much with this thing. I've barely talked about it, mostly because I wanted to focus on a few specific features. For the very specific things that I used it for, this thing has been a perfect synth, and I will go out of my way to replace it when this one does eventually die, because I just love it that much. It is maybe my favorite piece of music gear, and I don't say that lightly. But that's me and my very specific uses. I mean, the Prophet 08 had a desktop version and a keyboard version. And the MoFo even had two different keyboard releases with a third called the MoFo X4. The X4 is a MoFo with four voices. Does that sound familiar to you? The difference being on the X4, they got rid of multi-mode and combo mode because it was that unstable and it was that much of an issue. But the X4 was produced far, far after this thing was discontinued in 2016, a mere six years after it had come out. That's not great in the synth world. They are still producing the original Microcorgs and the Microcorg XL, which is an update from a few years later. It was a specialist product that came out in just the wrong time. In the world which is fully embracing analog again, DCO or VCO. In a world right before analog really fully exploded on the scene, Dave Smith took a weird chance with a weird box and it made me happy. I really like this synth. I think it's amazing. And I think a lot of people who are synth enthusiasts, I think they should own one of these. You can still get it for under $1,000. Do you know how much a JX3P is right now? Whether or not you even like DCOs, whether or not you even like analog synthesis, whether or not you like synthesis, I think this thing is very incredible. I think the features on it are way ahead of their time. And I think that really, if history is kind, it will remember the Dave Smith Instruments Tetra. But let me go ahead and break down my, my thoughts in just a few last sentences. Are you looking for a good first synthesizer? Avoid the Dave Smith Instruments Tetra. Are you a synth enthusiast looking to get better at synthesis and get into some like really crazy advanced techniques? Absolutely go get a Dave Smith Instruments Tetra. Are you an analog purist who refuses to ever touch anything with the DCO? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You should try it. Come on. Come on. This is a good synth. Come on. Come on. I really like the synthesizer. Come on. Thank you so much for watching this video. This is a very lengthy love letter to one of my favorite synthesizers of all time. I especially want to thank my Patreons who, my Patreons, my patrons. I want to give a big shout out to people on my Patreon. The link is down below if you would like to join. It's between three and $10 a month and you can get access to behind the scenes stuff and all sorts of great stuff. I want to thank everybody for watching this video. I was 
kind of blown away by my last video essay just sort of taking off and I hope this one is as enjoyable as the last one was. I should do better at words when I'm not reading a script. And uh, that's all I really can think of to say, so I'm going to go now. Bye! <laughs>